Okay, so uh, I work with Fugro. A lot of you probably know us as a geotechnical company, um, but my division outside of, uh, outside of Washington, D.C. in Maryland uh, specifically focuses on aerial data acquisition. So I uh, reside down here in the Land Asset Integrity Group where we have a fleet of aircraft that fly all over the uh, North and South America uh, collecting airborne data, whether it be uh, aerial LIDAR, imagery, obliques, and so on for mapping type scenarios. Uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about what we've just done over Houston. Um, we were working with a few folks uh, uh, you know, within the, uh, the state here to, to collect airborne LIDAR. For about the past year they've been planning, a year and a half they've been planning for an airborne LIDAR collection in the houston Galveston area. Um, this purpose, this project, was actually in the design phase prior to uh, the, the hurricane coming through. So um, this was uh, ultimately uh, in the works to collect LIDAR data to improve flood modeling map features near hazard areas. Uh, monitor water quality, post-storm restoration, and so on. Um, some of the applications, as you can see here, uh, are for floodplain management, planning, feature extraction, water quality modeling, stream restoration, potential analysis, change detection, and emergency management services. And the participants from this, as you can see, include uh, quite a few people. So collecting 10,000 square miles of LiDAR data is a bit expensive. So we work with a few folks to bring together, pull together the resources to be able to accomplish this task. Um, so ultimately it starts with the Texas Natural Resource Information Systems. These folks reside uh, under the Texas Water Development Board. These guys operate in the basement uh, of the TWD office in Austin, Texas. There's a handful of them there. And they're very instrumental in the state for orchestrating uh, airborne data collection efforts and mapping efforts throughout uh, the state of Texas. So what they do each year is they look at and see the, the need for, for mapping data and they pull together folks that may, you know, have interest in it and bringing those people together, kind of like a coalition of governments, allows them to collect a very large area for a much smaller cost at, at the per square mile rate. So you get a better economy of scale of pulling together all these folks. And uh, Timris, their goal is to collect LiDAR data over the entire state and make that publicly available so folks like yourselves can take the data and do something useful with it. Uh, in this project here, you can see in the pink there, this is the project boundary that we started with uh, before the storm. And they pulled together uh, folks from the uh, Houston County Flood Control District, the Houston Galveston Area Council, and the USGS. They all put their money in place to, uh, to be able to afford uh, this type of data collection. And then what they do is they run it through what's called the Texas Department of Information Resources uh, Group, which is a contracting agency for the state, that they competitively bid the project within a pool of kind of pre-selected um, pre uh, firms that are capable of, of acquiring such a, a large area and processing that amount of data. So we competed against it, uh, against our competitors, of course, um, and won this project uh, over, over this area. And we're slated to, uh, to start flying it I guess we were hoping to eventually just fly this over uh, the, um, the Houston area just after the first hard freeze. So ultimately what it means is that, uh, you know, when we're collecting LiDAR data, but by show of hands, does everybody know what LiDAR data is? Everybody, most people do? Okay, so airborne LiDAR data, for those that don't know, is uh, we have these twin engine aircraft that is a 19 inch hole, you know, cut through the belly of the aircraft and we have a LiDAR sensor that's mounted to the aircraft. And we go fly this. Um, for this project, I think we're flying somewhere around 2,400 feet. And uh, this is a laser system that hits this oscillating or rotating mirror and it sprays out these series of points, millions of points on the ground. And the time it takes that laser point to leave the aircraft, hit the ground, and come back, it's returned with uh, you know, an elevation and an intensity. Okay? And then we take that elevation data, we compile it into a usable system and create a digital elevation map from it. That's kind of the basics of it. This project, uh, like I said, it started out, to, it's about 10,000 square miles. And you can see this little section here over Matagorda Bay, we had to separate out a little bit because, um, uh, you know, based on the area size and the contract limits, we had to cut that out and use a different funding source. So in this case, 
we collected uh, most of this area through the Texas EIR contract. Um, and then the contracting for the, this section over Matagorda Bay had to be um, collected uh, this coming season uh, due to just you know, getting the contracts in order in time. But ultimately, our goal was to monitor the weather here, look for the first hard freeze. And after that first hard freeze, you typically have your uh, deciduous trees drop their leaves. And the reason we want those leaves off the trees is that when we're spraying those LIDAR points from the aircraft to the ground, we want to give them its best ability to reach the ground. Now, LIDAR data doesn't penetrate foliage. What we do is try to get the conditions just right so that we you know, get the most out of the data collection effort. In this case, uh, we didn't actually start flying until about mid-January. So we started a little bit late. Um, the first hard freeze was a little bit late, contracting was a little bit late. So we had a lot to do in a very short amount of time. Uh, in this scenario, we deployed uh, four aircraft to the area. We spread them out so that they could all focus on various portions of the project area and then um, and collect what we call production blocks uh, one at a time. This was the first time I've been flying uh, for about 20, two years, and actually I started back in about 1995, 96. Uh, some of my first work of uh, acquiring data as a flight uh, uh, systems technician was in Austin and Houston, uh, collecting imagery um, uh, back then. And over that time, over that 22 years, 23 years of flying, this is the first year I've ever come to, uh, say, Houston, and had four aircraft sit for two weeks and watch clouds and rain and ice and everything go by. So what that does is, if you can imagine, that shrinks my window of opportunity to collect a lot of data in a short amount of time. So anxiety was a little high. Uh, everybody was working really hard, and um, you know we were able to actually accomplish the task we set out to do. Once the data is collected, we send this over to our production facilities, and uh, you know, we have some here in Houston, Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, Frederick, Maryland, and Rapid City, South Dakota, and we chunk through all that data and we process this data to make it useful to you. And this data, because it's so much, it's actually going to take from the end of collection, which actually finished about March, which again is very rare for this area. Because we had that stall of bad weather in, in this winter time, uh, usually we have to wrap up flying at the end of February. Uh, this year we actually would collect a week or two into March, which is a bit strange. A little bit about the project specifications. I know a lot of you know what LIDAR data is, but perhaps you don't know what it takes to actually acquire them. Uh, in this scenario, we had. Uh, eight field crew members here, flight crew members, uh, four regal LIDAR sensors. We flew at 2,400 feet above the ground uh, with twin engine, four twin engine aircraft, and we flew uh, 932 flight lines and 30,000 uh, line miles. It's roughly 280 uh, uh, flight hours to accomplish the task. So you can see here, I kind of show you by color uh, these flight lines and how they lay out um, over the area. And I separated them by color so you could see that these are each individual production blocks. So we kind of chunk this data into little production blocks so we can get each block done at a time and get through the project. But you also see, you know, that we have a bunch of these little lines here, and we'll go into that in a second, across these, these cross ties. But flying 932 flight lines, 30,000 flight line miles, is equivalent to taking 1.243 trips around the Earth at the equator. So if you can imagine, you know, the amount of flying that we have to do in a very short order of time, uh, to accomplish this task. We uh, estimated about 61 lifts. So a lift, a lift is when an aircraft will leave its base of operations, go fly an area of interest, come back, you know, uh, download the data and ship the data out. So 61 lifts to acquire this data. Um, if you can imagine for a second the weather that we had this year, um, we have to fly this data where clouds are above us, okay? Um, with clouds above us, no rain, the water has to be within its normal banks, um, and no heavy winds. So we had to basically balance good weather with uh, flight opportunity within that short amount of time frame. But most importantly, we had to balance all that good weather, clouds, wind, uh, crew, fuel, airplanes, needing maintenance and so on, but also probably one of the most complex airspaces in the country. Now, each year we fly over Washington, D.C. We're one of the few companies that actually can fly over the White House and over the Capitol building, you know, fly over the most restricted non-flight areas in the country, and we get to do that. But here was, in, I would say, even more of a challenge because we're dealing now with managing weather, managing aircraft crews, uh, you know, people, 
coming in and out, of course, we want to try to get them home. Being on the road for three months is hard on people. But we're also managing that with this air traffic control. So we call it air traffic control each morning, and we try to fit ourselves in between all the aircraft that are coming in and out of Houston with two airports. Each airline, I think, has somewhere around 200 or 250 uh, uh, departures and arrivals per airline, per airport, uh, major airport. And I can imagine what to do here. You can understand the routes of incoming and outgoing aircraft. And while we're trying to fit ourselves in between that, you know, it's a bit of a challenge. So a lot of times our crews will have to fly one or two lifts a day. So they'll go up for four hours, they'll come back down, process the data. They get another window of opportunity, they have to go back up and fly another four hours. Eight hours a day in a small twin engine aircraft is a bit challenging. Sometimes they're doing it in the middle of the night. So LiDAR doesn't require uh, sun, like imagery, like you see in Google or anything like that. That requires the sun to be 30 degrees above the horizon to get a good image. Uh, with LiDAR data, we can fly at any time of day as long as there's no clouds below us, as long as there's no rain, no snow on the ground. Uh, rivers are within their normal banks, and uh, everybody's feeling good enough to go flying. But here, uh, you know, we're dealing with Houston area, uh, class uh, A, B, C, and D, a few jump areas of the college stations, and that's sort of uh, the, the Air Force Base, the restricted area. Um, so that kind of, hopefully, does that paint a decent picture of what it takes to actually deploy aircraft and, and get up there and acquire data? Um, instead, we now have to focus on more than just like uh, the flight lines. So flight line is typically like if you can imagine mowing your lawn, going back and forth for hours at a time, uh, trying to cover the area of interest. We designed this area with about 30% side lap of uh, the data collection. But what's unique to Houston is we have these cells of, of large buildings, and we have these tall, um, you know, tall, uh, tall bridges, and, and it's like spaghetti bowls of, of bridges basically throughout the area. So our planners have to pay really specific attention to where those buildings existed. Now the LiDAR system itself, if you can imagine, it's mounted on aircraft, it's got this rotating mirror. It's spreading points at a 60 degree field of view, 30 degrees each side of the meter. So at that edge of, of, of field of view, those LiDAR points are kind of going out at a bit of, a, a bit of an angle, right? And that works all fine and dandy, but when you're hitting something like, say, a, a building at an angle, we get what's called shadowing. Right? And to kind of account for that shadow, we wanted to get as many points on the ground um, as we possibly could uh, without uh, any kind of um, void areas. Right? So that shadowing we took specific attention to. So you see these lines here where we have some lines going in opposite directions, and then you see this really big group of flight lines uh, right here over the city. The reason we did that was because we took and we looked at each building, we looked at where a flight line was placed, and we looked at the angle of the LiDAR point as it was going to hit that building, and we started to measure, you know, with all these tall buildings, we're going to have some void areas within this. So we needed to pay, you know, place these flight lines right down the middle of the road so we got NATO points and got as close to the building as possible. Um, this doesn't typically happen on every project, but in Houston we understand and we understood the importance of getting as many good points on the ground and the relation to the bare earth ground to a building uh, as well as we could. So that was the reason why you see these little filler lines and cross ties and so on. Now, I'm going to go back up for a second. If you can see here these cross ties and the way we plan this, if you can imagine when you have these 932 flight lines, each flight line is actually kind of, as we collect it and as we, as we bring it into the production facility, um, they're not all lining up. So what we first have to do is position the data, then we have to do what we call bore site the data, which means we have to start lining up the flight lines to one another as they relate to each other. And, and why that's important is because, uh, if you can imagine, maybe when you're a kid, uh, you're throwing two by fours across the street to makeshift a little bridge. You know, those two by fours are all warped and all over the place, right? That's the same thing that happens to a flight line. The airplanes moving like crazy, we have IMB, we have GPS, we we're measuring everything. But, you know, it's not a straight flight, it's not simple. So those lines are all over the place. So like you, you can imagine those two by fours across the stream, they're right all over the place as well. Well, if you take this cross tie, which you see here, these cross lines, we place those across those flight lines. That kind of, and you nail those, if you do that as with the two by fours and you nail them together, it brings all those two by fours to a nice mosaic, clean, um, basically uh, surface. And that's exactly what we're doing with the flight lines. We're bringing that crazy warp stuff into something clean and manageable. So we have the flight lines, and then we have the ground control points, and we bring it on down to, uh, to, to, uh, to a good-looking data set. I failed to mention earlier, so the data itself, 
was actually um, the, the specifications for it. I think it was, and I don't have it here in the slide, but it's roughly a four point per square meter hydro flattened dam uh, with an intensity imagery. And, um, and that uh, had to meet about a 10 centimeter vertical accuracy measured as RMSE. Uh, typically, we've seen about uh, achieved six centimeters. So we always kind of beat that, that plan accuracy of 10 centimeter. Um, that's something that the state put together. But we always seem to, to beat that uh, because of the way we, we bore site the data, because of the way we use our ground control and bring it to, uh, to the bare earth. One thing to, to mention on that, so back to Tinris a little bit, you know, they do a fantastic job of, of managing this data, but they also do something very important. They start kind of creating the, the base specification for data collected in the state. So when Tinris is involved in a data collection effort like they are, they basically wrote the spec, a, a, a really great spec. Um, for collecting ladder data as it relates to uh, hydro modeling and floodplain analysis or um, uh, engineering, whatever you need uh, from this. They went a little bit above and beyond what's typical, say, uh, with some federal programs like uh, the USGS. They have a federal program called FREDA where they're going out trying to collect as much ladder data as they can throughout the country. But that's two points per square meter, different, a little bit different hydro specs. But with Tinris, you know, they, they've kind of added a bit more to make it a bit more useful. And uh, that is increasing the density, but it's also um, uh, doing a bit more classification with the data. And what I mean by that is this here. One of the products that you'll be receiving, and if I didn't mention this earlier, I apologize, uh, is that this data is collected, it's processed, it's paid for, and then this goes into the public system. So you'll be able to go out to Tinders's website and download the data and use it, uh, you know, Maybe there's a charge for receiving a hard drive or something of that nature. But this data set itself actually starts with the classified point cloud. This kind of gives you an idea of what a classified point cloud looks like. So we have these series of elevation points that we collected from the aircraft. We position them so they all line up. And now we have this, this mass of points, millions and millions of points that we have to manage. So we run them through these kind of automated filters or um, you know, algorithms to try to get the best automated approach as we could to separating or, or classifying each point as to what we think they are, whether it's a bare earth point, a point that represents water, a point that represents a, a building or a tree, um, or culvert, a culvert area. So uh, what our team does is they go through and they do this uh, auto classification, then they look through that data and they say, oh, how well did we do? Did we, did we over? stretch and we ever stay our welcome do we, do we do too much uh, auto filtering or too little you know um, and then we go back through and then we manually select these points and put a classification to that so at the end you get what they call this classified point cloud and the classified point cloud um, is used for a lot of things and, and you can create a lot of different products from that and one of them um, to, to, to kind of relate to a project we did last year. Uh, last year we collected roughly about the same size area, 10,000 square miles, over the city of Austin. Uh, city of Austin and San Antonio and San Jacinto County. Um, and what we did was we collected all this ladder data, we did, delivered what uh, Timber specifications to Timber deliverables, and then we started to get calls of folks that want to do something with the data. And this is really important because most of the time when I People come up to me and say, oh, you know, I'm really excited about the ladder data that you guys collected. I say, that's fantastic. What did you do with it? I say, well, nothing. It's sitting on the shelf. I haven't done anything with it yet. And that's a shame, you know, because you have this data that is so valuable, so, so rich with information. If only you knew how to manage it and how to actually bring it into your system, you know, make it useful. Make it worth the effort. Make it worth the investment. Um, and this is one case where I was working with the San Antonio River Authority where they wanted to get a good understanding of how much vegetation existed within the urban area. Um, now that's hard to do with a point cloud data set, right? So what we did is we took that point cloud, because we classified the vegetation in buildings, we actually took that data set and created what's called a vegetation height density, uh, height and density raster, so two products. And what's important about that is it made a, a basically an image uh, color-coded. In this case here, we have dark green to light green. Dark green meaning a very dense foliage data set, light green meaning a light, you know, less dense foliage data set. And what that does is it gives them an understanding of what's happening in 
in regards to vegetation. And you know, at first I thought, well, you know, you have you have imagery, you have four band imagery, but you know, you know, there's plenty of ways to determine if vegetation exists. But as a raster product, you can bring this in and see how vegetation is starting to interact with your world, whether it be roads or, or rivers. You can start to see that a dense data set, a dense foliage data set over a river may have a higher probability of dropping a lot of debris to that river and causing obstructions downstream. Uh, in one case in New England, I think somebody used the uh, vegetation raster product to determine how many acorns fell on a, on a street. And they're using this to actually properly deploy their street sweepers in better locations where they may be, may be needed versus having the street sweepers do clean you know, streets all the time. You know, to actually to properly deploy those groups. So if you can imagine taking this ladder data set and creating something as simple as a, a vegetation master product, you can start to analyze the world a little bit better. Another thing we did with them was created a uh, one foot contour. So this required us to take the data, create what we call a contour key point, the point on the ground that best represents the ground features to create a contour. And then we try to manage that data from what we call a LiDAR parametry based contour versus <coughs> a aesthetically pleasing photogrammetrically derived contour. Um, so we try to balance the two and create a contour data set that's actually affordable to them. And we did that over the entire uh, area of interest. So another product uh, that we're able to create for them, uh, what actually comes with the Tinners project, is a digital elevation model. And as you can imagine, yesterday, as we were listening to a lot of the talks, you start to kind of look at this data here a little bit more, I don't know, a little bit more aware now, I guess, when you start to look at that digital elevation model. So what we do here is we remove all those above ground features, right? So we have the buildings and trees and, and poles and, and fire hydrants and things that, are, that exist from above ground. We try to wipe all that clean so we can get a good, clear picture of the earth at, uh, at bare ground. And uh, this allows us to do that. I think for this product here, I think it was somewhere around what we call a one meter um, digital bare, bare earth digital elevation model. And that's one of the base products that's received, and that's going to be in the Tinders data set. So you can, you can actually go on Tinders' website when we're done processing and download this data and have it available to you. Again, it's at the 1070 vertical accuracy. It's, 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 it's a really decent data product. Um, one of the things that uh, we've seen a use case for is uh, over Fort Bend County. So in 2014, through Tinders and in coordination with Fort Bend County, we flew the entire county at four points per square meter to the tinder specification, the state specification. So this was, you know, 2014 before the storm. And then Fort Bend called me um, after the storm and says, you know, we're working on this, uh, this canal and we really need to have a good understanding of what's happening along this canal. What happened after the storm? Can you bring a crew down here, fly this 12.5 mile stretch of this canal? Um, I think it was from Katy to Tillichburg Park. And can you, you know, Give us a bear of them so we can compare against it pre-storm. Yeah, absolutely. So we deployed our crews, we flew the, the, the stretch of canal, and then we took the data and we delivered it. We get a call from them on hand, your, your data's bad. Something's wrong with it. And it's just, oh my gosh, you know, we, we take that very seriously, right? We're all pretty passionate about what we do. And we then started comparing the data set against the 2014 data, and now our data was like five or six centimeters in accuracy, so it wasn't wrong. The ground had moved that much. So when they're doing their sediment survey, they're out there deploying these uh, you know, front end loaders or backhoes or what have you to move dirt around along the canal. They see that it had moved in feet, they measured in feet, the amount of dirt that was moved because of the water that pushed through that area. So the importance of this would be having that base data, right? that, uh, that foundation of everything that's built upon it, right? That base data is that bare earth dam or classified point cloud. You collect that over the entire area. If something happens, you have a better chance of determining what's changed by comparing two elevation data sets. And that's really valuable now because then you can say, okay, we can know exactly how much dirt we need to move, where we need to focus, what happened after the change. And being able to do that change analysis using elevation data is a bit easier than, say, trying to do change analysis against the imagery. Um, but without that base data flown in 2014, we wouldn't have much to compare against. We could say this is how the, the ground looks today but you know, how much has changed in the past couple of years? How much has changed since the storm? And that's the important part, important part of that. So you can see here where you have the digital elevation model and the houses and the canal and, um, and then our comparison. What we do is we, we, we put that data right on top of each other and we do this diff, right? And it color codes, it gives us a color code map based on differences of change. 
And we could do this over very large areas, of course, but in this case, it's just a 12-month 12, 12 stretch of canal. And we can tell them exactly where to, where to cruise. So um, for this project, we are doing this hydroflattened bare earth dam. Now, essentially what this is, uh, we were talking about it earlier a little bit, but uh, when LIDAR hits certain things on the ground, it's returned with this intensity. But when it hits a reflecting surface like water, it sends it all over the place. We get false returns. So if you can imagine, um, I think this kind of shows it a little bit where this is not quite hydroflattened yet. You start to see all these little triangles and pyramids in the data because of these false returns in the LIDAR data. But what we want to do is give an accurate kind of uh, understanding. Of my yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> I have that in my to-do list. Turn the lights on, make sure you guys are listening. Um, so what we do here with this hyperflatten data set is um, we actually go in and manually compile these edges of the water, right? Because there's so much false data within that water set itself, we have to flatten it out. So we, we have folks actually sit there and compile lines along every single river, you know, greater than, say, 50 feet or 100 feet wide, and we flatten that data. We artificially just you know, get rid of all those false returns in between the banks so that you can start doing better water analysis from that. The hydro flattened data set essentially gives you um, kind of that better flat surface, but also uh, flowing in a downhill direction. You know, no, no water down there, it actually flows uphill. So what we do, any kind of false returns because of bad deflectance, we make sure that every stream, sink line stream or double line uh, river or what have you, is either flat if it's a lake or flowing downhill uh, if it's a river or stream. And this helps with some of your hydrologic modeling. And then hydro enforcement, if you're unaware, is, uh, uh, is the fact that when we go into the liner data, because we've classified the bridges, right, a span of bridges, now these points, that equals bridge, or this span of points equals a culvert. Well, if you're doing a modeling project and those culverts and bridges are left in this dam, you kind of have what's called artificial pooling, right? So when you do your modeling project, you're going to say, wow, this, this area is pooling up in this area because of uh, an obstruction. That's an artificial obstruction because the liner data doesn't actually represent the data flowing underneath the bridge or through a culvert. So we do what's called hydro enforcement. And hydro enforcement is paying very specific attention to the water network within a watershed. So you can imagine, I think somebody used the tree yesterday as an analogy of uh, a watershed, but the leaf, you know, the big, the big uh, veins of a leaf, you know, the major water networks, uh, what we would focus on for a hydro flattened project. Um, we would remove all the obstructions when we go into hydro enforcement. But all those little tiny things, all those little single line streams, we would go in and collect uh, for the hydro enforcement network so that we can actually have a, a more detailed look at the, the watershed. So those are the two. While you do receive the hydro flattened data set, it's not unheard of to actually take the data set and enhance it later in life, have somebody make it hydro enforced. In that case here, we do it for the USPS uh, throughout the country uh, for the 3D uh, elevation program. To, to kind of just monitor rivers, streams, lakes, reservoirs, and so on. Uh, I talked about the LIDAR point actually sending a pulse to the ground and uh, actually returning with an intensity. And this gives us this intensity map. Now, typically this looks like this here. It's usually black and white. You guys usually see them in black and white. But I like to color code my intensity values to make it a little bit more useful. Uh, in this case here, we actually, that intensity return, you know, so the reflective surface is different on an asphalt or concrete or a rooftop or a field or what have you. We create this, this image, right, this, this raster data product. And while it doesn't have a tremendous amount of use like the LIDAR point cloud or the bare earth dam, uh, we do use this to verify the horizontal accuracy, right, because elevation points only, we can, we can verify the vertical accuracy, but to vertical cloud, as compared to horizontal, we use this data set compared against ground control and determine how well we fit, you know, within the tolerances. But we can also start to do some sort of feature extraction from that. We call it LiDAR grammetry. Kind of like photogrammetry, but using LiDAR data, we can start to extract features like buildings, uh, roads, streams, and so on. We do a lot of work with, uh, with uh, power companies where we're collecting like 30 to 100 points per square meter over major distribution networks and we're actually extracting every little detail of every little single line power system. And we can actually measure, you know, the house in relation to the power line and pole, whether the pole's leading too far on the spec, or it's drooping too far, or it's somebody built a house underneath it. And, uh, so we monitor that system using LiDAR data. And that's the combination of the point cloud data set 
and the intensity step. So it's very, really quite a useful product. So, you know, yesterday I heard a lot of talk about funding sources uh, for uh, stormwater management, and I'm going to jump over to Austin real quick. Um, that basically concludes me talking about the, the data products and the, the data collection efforts over the coastal area. But I'd like to go into a little bit more some of the other works we're doing in Texas that are related to stormwater management. And um, over the city of Austin, uh, every year, every two years, we go through and we fly six inch imagery from them and we update what they call a planometric data set. And the planometric data set is this uh, one inch equals 100 scale map uh, data set that is basically vector data that represents houses and roads and bridges and, um, and vegetation and so on. And they, they maintain this in the city in their GIS. But what they do now is we actually start to classify. We, we take each of those planometric data sets and we give it a, uh, uh, an impervious or pervious value to it. So now that we have roads, we say that's impervious. Or a, a big field is, is pervious. Right? So now that we have this, this data set of, of polygons and lines that say this is impervious versus pervious, they can actually cut that and calculate the amount of impervious versus pervious to every landowner. And they actually take that data because, well, I haven't heard too much about it, uh, impervious data, impervious areas do have a major impact into flash flooding. And to measure that impervious area, and I've heard here in Houston you have quite a bit of concrete and asphalt, you know, it's very important because the water comes down and has nowhere to go. It seeps, it doesn't seep into the ground. It, it immediately goes off to where it can seep into the ground, or it goes to a river, or it goes to, a, uh, a, to the ocean. You know, because it's impervious, that uh, has a big impact into stormwater management. So for the city of Austin, we actually collect that impervious versus pervious area, and we calculate that within each landowner. So each parcel says, okay, you have so many square feet of impervious area. Well now, they don't get, it's not what they call a tax, it's what they call a stormwater management fee. And that helps them fund, you know, their stormwater management program. So more so than applying a tax, they say, well, if somebody has a plot of land and it's all uh, fields, obviously they don't have a stormwater management fee, maybe like the guy next to him that has, you know, 20 acres of concrete. Because that person that has 20 acres of concrete has a bigger <coughs> impact on what happens to the water when it comes from the sky and hits the ground. That makes sense? And that's all in part, uh, a part of this TINRIS, Capillary Council of Governments, and the Texas DIR. That's all part of them pooling together resources, like I talked about earlier, the importance of TINRIS, and bringing people together, forming all these folks. In this case, we have City of Austin, BK, Burnett, Marble Falls, Lugerville, Round Rock, Waco, um, Clinton County, and so on. They pull together their, their funding, which if you do a single project, if I just did BK, and I have to send an aircraft to BK, or obviously it has a mobilization fee and it costs a lot of money. But if I send an aircraft down to do 10,000 square miles, that mobilization fee and that setup stuff is, is kind of spread out through a lot of people, so they pay quite a bit less. So someone can actually get a really intense data set for a few thousand dollars versus spending $20,000. So they, you know, it really has quite a benefit to them. I'll talk about a little bit a little bit. So the future, right? The future is you're going to have a lot of data here, about 10,000 square miles of data, and you're going to be able to do something with it. Here's a small little list, and we can do quite a bit more. Now, if you can imagine, now, you got the little contours, red rasters, fault line delineation from the bare earth dam, change the direction, and so on. But one of the things we're working on is what's called hag and lag. Highest adjacent grade, lowest adjacent grade. Because we have houses and bare earth dam, if we can somehow calculate from this lagger data, accurately calculate the highest adjacent, lowest adjacent grade, that's a calculation that goes into your flood certificate. So we're working on trying to develop a program and verify the accuracy of those results to be able to do a very wide area calculation of every house, every house's highest point, highest ground point, lowest ground point, so they can apply those elevation values to their flood certificate. Because as I understand it now, someone that's gaining a flood certificate has to have a survey that come out to the area with their points and actually measure those high and high points, and it costs them like five or seven hundred dollars to, to survey that. Well, using lighter data, maybe we can get that down to ten. You know, and then all of a sudden it's affordable to get a flood certificate. So if you can think about what we're trying to do with LiDAR data and how we're trying to make it useful, but useful not in the way of analyzing this, but useful in making measurements in which it impacts community. So if people it's more affordable, now people can start to actually get flood insurance because they can actually afford a flood certificate. Last, I'll, I'll close on where we're going. So 
I say the future here, but actually we did this about a year ago uh, over Pennsylvania. We're combining these data sources. We have LiDAR data. I said earlier we have oblique imagery. And uh, what we're doing now is combining this. We're creating this autocorrelated pixel-based point cloud from the oblique imagery, right? So you can see the size of buildings. And we're using the LiDAR data for the vertical accuracy. And we're creating countywide 3D models, right? So in uh, Cambria County, Pennsylvania, we flew the entire county with just oblique imagery, not LiDAR, created this pixel-based point cloud, and actually created a 3D model over their entire county for what the cost of what they typically do for just an imagery collection program. So we've generated this you know, by working with you know, the folks at Fugro and some other uh, processing companies. We joined this team of people to develop this system where we can do very large area 3D models. And what's important about that is you can, one, start to do better analytics of the area and, the, um, and, and what's going on because of really good data sets. But now we can start to interact with above and below ground GIS features. So in this case here, Cambria County had a lot of coal mines, a lot of uh, uh, fracking in the Marcellus and Utica Shale. They really needed to get a good understanding and a good picture of an oil um, drill site location and the frack distance you know, over. So they have a mineral rights, a mineral right area, and then they have a land ownership right. But how do they interact with one another? With a 3D world that we develop, we're actually able to move seamlessly between above and below ground features. So if the data exists, we can bring it in, we can actually see how the below ground features are interacting with the above ground world. So that's where we're headed, right? Now, it's, it's, it's slowly taking off. It's, uh, we're, you know, we're getting into better with the accuracies and better with the functionalities. But we're making the system uh, affordable to collect, but also uh, accessible. So you don't have to be a GIS professional to navigate in a 3D environment. It's recognizable. And that's where I think you know, everybody should start to head. And this here shows just a bit of a simulation. In the 3D world, I can do anything. I can make it snow. I can apply wind. I can, I can make it rain. I can put a building on fire. I can actually deploy. I give it a time component, right? So in my 3D world, I can actually measure the time it takes for a, uh, an ambulance or a fire truck to leave the fire station and get to this building, where they park, but then also what's the distance to the water source, whether it be, uh, you know, 100 feet or 200 feet, tells them exactly how much hose they need to bring, right? This is all developed from this GIS data. And why that's important is because now this is all placed into their E911 systems, right? So a call center, a person gets a call and they're deploying a the crew, they can actually see this real world. We can tie into their, if we have geolocators on them, or their trucks, we can actually watch them, you know, drive throughout the area in this GIS network. It's real time, so it's 4D now, right? We have time component, we have real time situations. It can bring in security cameras and actually see uh, in its proper location, you know, where this, uh, what's going on. That's the importance of uh, expanding from, say, 2D to 3D and then bringing in the 4D environment. I think I'm out of time. So, that's it. That's what I got for you. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate y'all letting me uh, bend your ear.